Towards the end of the revolution, the Continental Congress, meeting here at Independence Hall, grew desperate for money. In 1781, they allowed Robert Morris, their financial superintendent, to open a privately owned central bank. Incidentally, Morris was a wealthy man who had grown wealthier during the revolution by trading in war materials. Called the Bank of North America, the new bank was closely modeled after the Bank of England. It was allowed to practice fractional reserve banking. That is, it could lend out money it didn't have, then charge interest on it. If you or I were to do that, we would be charged with fraud, a felony. The bank's charter called for private investors to put up $400,000 worth of initial capital. But when Morris was unable to raise the money, he brazenly used his political influence to have gold deposited in the bank, which had been loaned to America by France. He then loaned this money to himself and his friends to reinvest in shares of the bank. And, like the Bank of England, the bank was given a monopoly over the national currency. Soon the dangers became clear. The value of American currency continued to plummet. So, four years later, in 1785, the bank's charter was not renewed. The leader of the effort to kill the bank, William Findlay of Pennsylvania, explained the problem this way, quote, This institution, having no principle but that of avarice, will never be varied in its object to engross all the wealth, power, and influence of the state. The men behind the Bank of North America, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Morris, and the bank's president, Thomas Wiling, did not give up. Only six years later, Hamilton, then Secretary of the Treasury, and his mentor, Morris, rammed a new privately owned central bank through the new Congress. Called the first bank of the United States, Thomas Wiling again served as the bank's president. The players were the same, only the name of the bank was changed. In 1787, colonial leaders assembled in Philadelphia to replace the ailing Articles of Confederation. As we saw earlier, both Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were unalterably opposed to a privately owned central bank. They had seen the problems caused by the Bank of England they wanted nothing of it. As Jefferson later put it, if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations which grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. During the debate over the future monetary system, another one of the founding fathers, Gouverneur Morris, castigated the motivations of the owners of the Bank of North America. Gouverneur Morris headed the committee that wrote the final draft of the Constitution. Morris knew the motivations of the bank well. Along with his old boss, Robert Morris, Gouverneur Morris and Alexander Hamilton were the ones who had presented the original plan for the Bank of North America to the Continental Congress in the last year of the Revolution. In a letter he wrote to James Madison on July 2nd, 1787, Gouverneur Morris revealed what was really going on. The rich will strive to establish their dominion and enslave the rest. They always did they always will. They will have the same effect here as elsewhere if we do not, by the power of government, keep them in their proper spheres. Despite the defection of Governor Morris from the ranks of the bank, Hamilton, Robert Morris, Thomas Wiling, and their European backers were not about to give up. They convinced the bulk of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention to not give Congress the power to issue paper money. Most of the delegates were still reeling from the wild inflation of the paper currency during the Revolution. They had forgotten how well colonial scrip had worked before the war. But the Bank of England had not. 
the money changers could not stand to have America printing her own money again. So the Constitution is silent on the matter. This grievous defect left the door wide open for the money changers, just as they had planned. In 1790, less than three years after the Constitution had been signed, the money changers struck again. The newly appointed first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, proposed a bill to the Congress calling for a new privately owned central bank. Coincidentally, that was the very year that Amschel Rothschild made his pronouncement from his flagship bank in Frankfurt. Let me issue and control a nation's money, and I care not who writes the laws. Alexander Hamilton was a tool of the international bankers, and he wanted to create the U.S. Bank, the BUS, or the Bank of the United States, and did so. Interestingly, one of Hamilton's first jobs after graduating from law school in 1782 was as an aide to Robert Morris, the head of the Bank of North America. In fact, the year before, Hamilton had written Morris a letter saying, a national debt, if it is not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. A blessing to whom? After a year of intense debate, in 1791, Congress passed the bill and gave it a 20-year charter. The new bank was to be called the First Bank of the United States, or BUS. Here we are in front of the First Bank of the United States in Philadelphia. The bank was given a monopoly on printing U.S. currency, even though 80% of its stock would be held by private investors. The other 20% would be purchased by the U.S. government, but the reason was not to give the government a piece of the action. It was to provide the capital for the other 80% owners. As with the old Bank of North America and the Bank of England before that, the stockholders never paid the full amount for their shares. The U.S. government put up their initial $2 million in cash. Then the bank, through the old magic of fractional reserve lending, made loans to its charter investors so they could come up with the remaining $8 million of capital needed for this risk-free investment. Like the Bank of England, the name of the Bank of the United States was deliberately chosen to hide the fact that it was privately controlled. And like the Bank of England, the names of the investors in the bank were never revealed. Many years later, it was a common saying that the Rothschilds were the power behind the old Bank of the United States. The bank was sold to Congress as a way to bring stability to the banking system and eliminate inflation. So what happened? Over the first five years, the U.S. government borrowed $8.2 million from the Bank of the United States. In the same five-year period, prices rose by 72%. Jefferson, as the new Secretary of State, watched the borrowing with sadness and frustration, unable to stop it. I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution, taking from the federal government the power of borrowing. Millions of Americans feel the same way today. They watch in helpless frustration as the federal government borrows the American economy into oblivion. So, although it was called the First Bank of the United States, it was not the first attempt at a privately owned central bank in this country. As with the Bank of North America, the government put up most of the cash to get this private bank going, then the bankers loaned the money to each other to buy the remaining stock in the bank. It was a scam, plain and simple, and they wouldn't be able to get away with it for long. But first, we have to travel back to Europe to see how a single man was able to manipulate the entire British economy by obtaining the first news of Napoleon's final defeat. <laughs>